Chronicle Heritage is a multinational heritage management firm. But I think for the purposes of this discussion, we really want to focus on something that has a, an entity that has global reach, one or two or multiple firms that have the capacity to do heritage all over the globe uh, simultaneously. And, and that's kind of the thought experiment we'd like to explore today and to kind of dig into what that means um, to our industry, some of the value that such an entity would bring to the table, some of the obstacles that have prevented a global heritage firm from emerging in our market that we see, and then some pathways towards something along the lines of a, a global heritage firm. So I'd like to have our CEO, Sean Fehrenbach, come up and join me today, and he'll be talking about Chronicle Heritage and give an introduction to the company. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I guess I'll start by grounding us a little bit in heritage uh, by apologizing for my accent. Um, I want to say thanks to all of you who uh, live here in this beautiful city, this wonderful country for hosting us. Um, my ethnicity is roughly modeled, I think it is, on Rubicon's uh, corporate structure. Uh, so I'm, my last name is Fehrenbach. I'm about half German, uh, about a quarter Irish and a quarter English. Um, so uh, there's meaning in all of these you know, tangible uh, pieces of our past to all of us. Uh, and kind of a nice point of human connection to think about what these things mean uh, to somebody else. Uh, they can mean different things to different people. But as we talk about the value of heritage and what it means to run a business, I think there's a lot of uh, value in having larger entities in the heritage space that really start to operate at a global scale. There's one point that I think Steve will hit on later, uh, which is this natural tension between the need to understand things deeply at a local level, right? That's it's hugely important to us, not only as heritage professionals, but also because the regulatory landscape is so fragmented, you know? Um, certainly growing up in the United States as Chronicle did, uh, it's a massively fragmented regulatory landscape. Uh, Ellen talked about the National Heritage, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, and how it delegates authority to the SHPOs. So that's cross-cut by the agencies in the states. There's 150 different ways of doing the same darn, same darn thing that we all do in Section 106 in the states, just because the regulatory landscape is so fragmented. Most of us in the UK. Uh, in the United States, we work in compliance heritage work. It's all driven by laws, but there's so much more that Steve will talk about in terms of tourism activation uh, and really driving value from heritage that's not compliance driven uh, in the ways that, that we do this. So many businesses in our industry kind of get tunnel vision, I think, uh, and really focus deeply and, and really value that expertise and I think the point of this talk will be to talk about the value of operating at larger scales, because there is a lot of value. Uh, and Steve will talk about some of those values. I kind of tend to sum up a few points, but there are so many things that we all recognize are problems within our industry, whether it's having career trajectories for employees or, or appropriate pay scales or diversity, equity, inclusion uh, initiatives or technology. All of these things we can get much better traction on creating solutions for if we have some larger entities. Uh, and so that's a bit of the thesis uh, behind Chronicle and where we started. We were founded in 2006 in Arizona um, under a different brand, Paleo West. Uh, and over the years we've grown um, in, in multiple ways. We've always been a growth oriented heritage company uh, we've seen the value in that, and we've always been progressive. Uh, we've seen that there's a lot of conservatism in the business of heritage. There's that fragmentation tends to lead to smaller organizations that either don't have the resources or are a bit afraid of investing in change. And when you look at the business world more broadly, 
private institutions tend to be actually much more progressive than what we see, I think, in businesses in the heritage space. And there's good reason for that. It can be very healthy to take some risks in business. Um, and it can be very rewarding, not only from the financial sense, but in terms of progressively reshaping an industry towards the values of that industry. And so we want to orient this towards both of those things, I think, today. Uh, we've grown not only through acquisitions, I think we have something like 15 brands that have come together. Uh, we rebranded recently as Chronicle, largely because we had so many brands that had come together. And we really look towards an integrated model uh, where we can bring different organizations and without destroying the value of those individual organizations or that local presence and expertise, we can add value to these organizations by understanding what they do so well in their context and bringing them together and adding resources to, to all of these companies that we uh, tend to bring together when we're working through m &A. Uh, and really creating efficiencies and uh, organiz organizational uh, uh, benefits by having a corporate structure that can operate uh, and, and share ideas across the organization. That said, uh, probably less than half of our growth is inorganic through mergers and acquisitions. Uh, most of our growth is, is organic, um, either amplifying uh, what we already do in certain markets um, uh, or building into new markets. Um, <clears throat> the heritage industry tends to be very fragmented. I've had conversations over the last day or so with, with several of you around how fragmented it is. I think in the US, it's actually a lot more fragmented than in the UK. The UK is actually, in a lot of ways, a much more mature market, even though it's smaller compared to the total addressable market in the US compliance world. Um, you, you all have seen more consolidation. You have some larger entities operating uh, in terms of percentage market share within the UK. And I think that's a healthy space and one that we're trying to move towards and replicate in the United States. Having some organizations that might have something like 10 or 15% market share rather than the largest having something like 3 to 5% market share is actually very healthy for an industry. And it creates a situation where folks see that there are real career opportunities for them. It creates opportunities for professional development within organizations, lateral moves, uh, opportunities to learn new skills, resources within companies where they can invest in employees, and all of these things are really what we're trying to achieve. Um, in terms of scale, we now have 40-ish offices and about 850 active employees within Chronicle, which I, I believe makes us the largest uh, private heritage organization that's centered on heritage in the world. We're private equity backed. Um, about two and a half years ago, we had an investment from private equity investors, and I think that's important to understand why and what that means in terms of ownership. Most uh, heritage organizations are, are founder owned and operated. Uh, there are some that have take, had transitions of ownership um, in the United States. There's some ESOPs, employee stock option programs. Uh, there have been situations where founders have sold to uh, one or a group of employees. That transition planning for organizations is very important. It's something that ACRA is focused on a lot in creating mature organizations that can outlive you know, singular folks who are at the center of those businesses. We chose a private equity investment because we were at a certain stage where uh, we were growing very fast. We've always grown very quickly. Uh, at times, we have 100, 150% growth in top line uh, year over year. Uh, and that can be a huge capital strain. Private equity obviously has deep pockets for the type of capital that it takes to fund that pace of growth. But more than that, what we got from our private equity investors was business expertise. We found ourselves, you know, at the time of that investment, right around 200, 250 active employees. And we realized that it was stupid to keep training archaeologists to try and do all of the things, you know, to be technology people or HR professionals or whatever it was. That was ineffective in an organization that size. So we could take 
a bunch of hard knocks and try and learn by hiring those people into our organization and learn from them. Or we could uh, reach out, we needed the capital and the ownership transition anyway, to folks who had deep business expertise and could add those connections and the understanding of what it took to scale a company from that size to the next level into our organization. And that's what private, e private equity brought for us. Um, in terms of our international expansion, you want me to take this one too? In terms of our international expansion, uh, before Riverside, we were already working internationally a bit, um, but it was mostly through US contracts uh, that were executed overseas. We also have a technology uh, company, a relationship with a technology subsidiary that was doing some work overseas. Um, but uh, in June 2022, we had our most significant international expansion, which was into Saudi Arabia. I think most folks know about the huge initiatives in Saudi Arabia to uh, diversify their economy away from petroleum products. And there's massive investments going on uh, and massive changes within that country going on um, that we've been, we've been lucky enough to be involved in the heritage side of that expansion and diversification of their economy and seen it grow very quickly. Um, uh, in November of 2023, we actually set up our first international uh, private entity in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're pretty proud of that. So we're truly multinational company now, uh, working uh, with 40 offices, most of those in the States, but now a, a true entity in Saudi Arabia. Um, we have 60 full-time heritage professionals working in Saudi Arabia uh, with 100 plus project-based team members. The the Third point there is staff from 15 different countries. Uh, we're actually a mid-sized UK firm with uh, 18 employees out of the UK and zero dollars in revenue in, in the UK. Uh, all those staff are working in. But with staff from 15 different countries, we've really realized uh, part of the dream, which is how do you bring together heritage professionals from diverse contexts and get them all working together towards shared initiatives. It creates an atmosphere where there's tons of information sharing and we can really not only improve the lives of the employees, but really improve the practice of, of what we're doing and value of heritage. And I think uh, before I turn it back over to Steve, the point there is to really create conversation, not only create successful businesses that are scalable, profitable uh, and stable that can create those career trajectories and make some money for those of us who have taken the risks as business owners and stepped out and started uh, these companies within this space. But to create broader conversations around what heritage is and why it matters to different people, why the differences and why tangible heritage matters uh, to different people creates important conversations to have. If we can reinforce those conversations by bringing together heritage professionals and creating opportunities for them to work together, we ultimately drive the value of heritage within society more broadly. It would be very good for our employees, all of our stakeholders, and for us as business. Thanks, Sean. So I'm going to resume the talk now. Um, Sean gave us details on Chronicle Heritage, kind of our founding and, and the larger picture and vision that, that drives him and the rest of the, the leadership team at the company. And we're going to kind of step back into the abstract and, and talk once again about what a, a global heritage management uh, firm or firms might look like. What, in particular, what values do they bring to the market space and what obstacles have prevented such a firm from, from really developing? So uh, Sean touched on some of the values that, that he and I think a large scale uh, global firm could bring to the industry. But uh, I kind of think about these in three different groups, scientific values, social values, and then economic values. So from a scientific perspective, I think uh, a multinational workforce is a great driver of innovation. Um, when you bring together people with all sorts of training and backgrounds, and we've seen this in person with our operations in Saudi Arabia, you get a lot of great ideas flowing back and forth across the team about how to improve uh, operations, how to improve documentation, how to you know 
the quality of the work is, is going to go up. And this is something that we've been able to witness firsthand and is uh, a, an important contribution to scientific value. The bigger the group and the more diverse the group you can bring together on projects, the better the results in terms of innovation. Secondly, uh, scientific value that's driven by a larger corporation would be the ability to disseminate results. So that may not be as relevant in the UK or the US markets where we have annual conferences where archeologists like ourselves will present our findings. But if you start expanding out into other countries, uh, you get results that are very siloed and oftentimes exciting archeological discoveries that are made in these other countries are not getting disseminated uh, at the world stage. They're not being put in place where other people can appreciate and learn from the results. So this is another advantage, breaking down silos, and that has a, a positive impact on the science that we're doing as an industry. We also think there's a lot of social value to a large global firm. So um, it would adva advance heritage regulations. We all are familiar with international organizations like UNESCO and ECOMOS, who've done a great job um, promoting heritage around the globe a lot of that promotion has been focused on cultural heritage tourism. There's not really an international voice that represents regulatory work or heritage work at a global scale that can promote the importance of regulatory frameworks for protecting heritage. What we see at the international level from UNESCO and ECOMOS is really focused on monumentality. How do we take this important heritage, share it with the world, and generate tourism from it? And that's a valid and important approach. What's lacking in this is somebody at the table who can speak to the importance at a global level of a regulatory environment. We also believe that a, a larger global firm would increase uh, employee diversity. And, and I'm aware that Sean and I are not exactly a great representation of that. Um, but when you do bring people from all different countries together, you're creating opportunities for advancement for people of all different backgrounds and that inevitably leads to greater diversity. In addition, with more sophisticated business practices, as you have larger scale, you can implement more robust HR teams, and these HR teams can, can track diversity at a corporate level, akin to what we see in the large a &E firms like Jacobs or Atkins. And so this can lead to a more sophisticated uh, promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion within our firms. Then finally, coming to the economic value, uh, as was mentioned earlier by, by Chris, having all of your eggs in one basket is always a risk. So spreading out across different markets as a business owner helps uh, de-risk the situation. So diversification is always beneficial from that perspective. And we see that in the United States. Uh, Chronicle Heritage has diversified across all the different states in the US. Um, I think globally the same conditions apply if you're operating in multiple countries, that creates more business stability. That ultimately creates more stability for your employees. They can depend on a paycheck more regularly. There's less concern about layoffs if you can spread the risk and be in multiple markets. And of course, as I mentioned, stability and opportunities for employees. So Sean touched on this earlier again, but a company at scale that can provide a stable work environment for a diverse employment, employee force can also provide new opportunities for employees. As the business grows, they can grow into new roles and forge a new path for their own careers. And again, with a more robust HR policy, which is required um, for, a, for a bigger operation, you can also implement more sophisticated professional development operations and, and try to uh, act in a more mature business way as you grow your HR team. There are a lot of obstacles that have present, prevented a global heritage firm from really uh, take from from coming together. Uh, and Sean touched on it again: the the highly fragmented nature of the regulatory environment, and what we see is a kind of inherent tension between the need for local expertise and the desire to have a global set of resources to empower that local expert. So this is a, a tension where you have from you know. From our discipline, you need the local archaeologists that know the material culture very well. At the same time, a, a global entity could provide these local archaeologists with, with the professional expertise, the software, the technology, the, the back office support, the career opportunities, the professional stability to really thrive in that local environment. 
Uh, then the other obstacle to, to forming a global heritage management firm is, is of course, the high startup costs. So um, there's, every country has different startup costs. They can vary considerably, but you're talking about market analysis, the formation of a legal entity, tax advisors, legal teams. All of this gets factored into to opening an entity in a new office. And um, they can range anywhere from tens of thousands of pounds to hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending on where you're, where you're moving. And this really is, is one of the largest limiting factors in expanding internationally. So having set out the values uh, that we want to achieve as a firm and having addressed the obstacles, there are a couple different pathways that, that we think that can help overcome some of these obstacles or at least minimize them to move towards achieving these values that, that we hold um, and wanna, want to obtain. So the first is this um, pattern of, of a kind of foreign vendor operation where you can participate in a market at limited scale as a remote employee and, um, and develop contracts or do some consulting with, with key clients to better understand the market. And when there are tasks that require boots on the ground, then you can leverage a local firm and contract directly with that or contract with them to execute the work. So this is kind of a consultant subcontractor relationship where you can operate outside the country consulting. This is a great way to experiment and learn how the market works. Uh, we've done this a number of times um, and it, it gets you knowledge of the market and you can assess whether you want to invest um, in, a, in a legal entity. Of course, the limits are and it depends on each country, but there are oftentimes limits of how much time you can spend in the country, how revenue flows, what tax liabilities you're looking at, and these all require um, research on a country by country basis. The other option is opening a legal entity and jumping in uh, full speed. And um, as I mentioned, that has a considerable startup cost. You're not gonna wanna do that for a small contract. You want something big that you can build around right away. And, um, and this, again, is, is a more expensive option and, and can be time consuming, but uh, an important alternative to the foreign vendor operation. And of course, once you're in the country, then you know, there's no real limit on the revenue you can generate there. So I would imagine that as a global heritage firm or as they develop around our industry, we should anticipate a kind of blended approach of participating partially and remotely in the market, and then also opening legal entities. This would help mitigate risk and then maximize on gains once you understand the potential of a market, at least as well as you, as you can from, from remote uh, work. Uh, now, as we mentioned, there is this tension between the local, the hyper-local nature of our industry and the value that global resources can bring to that local level. We've seen a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of local and regional businesses because we have a highly fragmented industry. Now, I, I don't see the uh, introduction of a global heritage management firm as uh, threatening to these local or regional operations. I think they can work together. Um, as I mentioned with the foreign vendor operation, uh, it might even be um, a reciprocal re relationship where the, the larger global firm can provide the consulting and the advising while the local firms, the regional operations subcontract and they're actually, the global firm would then be the client. So this is a, seems like a positive relationship. Of course, once an entity is opened in the country, I think again, this doesn't mean that they're in direct competition with the local or regional firms. Um, again, this is hypothetical, but I would imagine that a global firm would have a much higher overhead and that lar larger overhead would tend to price them towards large scale contracts that are driven by capacity and, and margins. Whereas the local and regional businesses would still be able to maintain a book of clients that's not in direct competition with the global firm. So thank you very much everyone for your time. Um, Sean and I would be happy to take questions.